Hello everybody, today's topic is turbulence and collision avoidance. My name is Mike Thompson, welcome to the Epic Flight Academy. This is the Private Pilot Ground School course and this series of videos parallels the content that you are studying in Epic's online course. So you look at the course, you look at these videos, and then thirdly, of course, you're going to review all of this content with your flight instructor one-on-one. -on -one. So what about turbulence? Well, in particular today, we want to discuss wake turbulence. Now, wake turbulence is the type of turbulence that we occur, that we find occurring behind other aircraft. Now, certainly we see it behind other large aircraft. Well, actually, we see it behind any aircraft. Small general aviation airplanes, helicopters, military jets, and certainly the big uh, heavy uh, airline jets. Now, what makes wake turbulence more dangerous behind heavier airplanes? Heavier aircraft are generating more lift, so they generate stronger wingtip vortices, which means stronger wake turbulence. But remember, that does not mean that helicopters or even small, smaller, lighter aircraft don't generate wake turbulence. They do. The heavier the airplane, the stronger the wake turbulence. So, why is that? What's actually going on? What's happening with wake turbulence is some basic aerodynamics. Now you already know two things about basic aerodynamics. One is high pressure air rushes to fill low pressure air vacuums. We see that anywhere in nature and we see it on an airfoil. On an airfoil, secondly, you already know this, we are creating low pressure air above the wing relative to higher pressure below the wing. Well, that high pressure air still wants to rush and fill that low pressure vacuum, but of course it can't go through a solid wing. Ah, but you know what? it can go around the wingtip. So imagine my hand here is the wing and I've got lower pressure air due to increased airflow over the top relative to higher pressure air underneath. This higher pressure air wants to flow around the wingtip toward this lower pressure air. So it's going to make a movement like this. Now while that's happening, my hand or the wing is moving forward and that airflow is back here like this making a little tornado in the wake of my airplane. That's wake turbulence. They literally are little tornadoes. So as pilots, we know this occurs. If I'm landing or taking off behind another airplane, especially a big heavy airplane, how can I avoid this? Well, remember those uh, wingtip vortices that wake turbulence around the wingtips, those little tornado vortices are going to occur when the aircraft starts to produce lift. So if it's rolling down the runway, those little wingtip vortices start at liftoff. If the aircraft is landing, those little wingtip vortices end as the airplane touches down. Now I'm going to use that to my advantage. I'm going to remember if I'm landing behind that airplane, I'm going to land beyond their touchdown point. If I am taking off behind that airplane, I'm going to take off prior to their takeoff point. Now, if I'm in a 172, 
and I'm operating at Daytona Beach with a, um, oh, I don't know, an Airbus or something, I can certainly land beyond his touchdown point. And I can certainly take off prior to his liftoff point. But am I going to be able to outclimb that jet in my little 172? Well, the chances are no. In fact, the chances are really good that the answer is no. One other consideration I want to think about, and this is going to help me out. Those little wingtip vortices, after they're created and before they dissipate, will drift downwind. So if there's a slight crosswind, let's say from my right, and the aircraft ahead of me has the vortices drifting downwind to my left, when I rotate, I'll sidestep to my right or into the wind a little bit and let those vortices drift on downwind. So to put it all together, the memory aid is we want to try to land and take off in the cup and upwind. Now, in the cup, if you imagine the approaching aircraft landing, that's one side of my cup, and you imagine the departing aircraft taking off, that's the other side of my cup. So if I'm inside the cup, it's after their landing point or before their departure point. That's inside the cup. And because I cannot outclimb them, I'm going to sidestep into the wind. So simple memory aid. Stay in the cup and sidestep into the wind. That's a short explanation of wake turbulence. Be sure to review it online and with your flight instructor. Now, very closely attached is the concept of collision avoidance. Let's talk about that just for a second. What I would like you to do is open up your FAR and go to part 91. Now, in the table of contents of part 91, I want you to look at subpart A, and here we are going to find regulations that start with 100s. So here's a tip. We're looking for the regulations in the table of contents that are 91.100 and something. The first one is 91.113, and this is known as the right-of-way regulation. Now, when you start to read this regulation, right away you're going to notice that it says all aircraft must see and avoid other aircraft, no matter if they're on a VFR or an IFR flight plan. And this is where that term see and avoid comes from. We talk about see and avoid, and we wonder where's that regulation? That's 91.113 right-of-way. Now this right-of-way regulation talks about aircraft approaching each other head-on, in which case we're both supposed to turn right. It talks about uh, one aircraft overtaking another. You'll see that it talks about aircraft in a traffic pattern. Who has right-of-way in a traffic pattern? the aircraft on final or the aircraft at a lower altitude. So these concepts are all important to your review online and with your instructor. The next one in 91 we want to talk about is 119, 91, 119. This is minimum safe altitudes. So we're out there flying around and um, can I just fly at any altitude I want? Well, kind of but I have to be careful about a couple of things. First of all, what kind of airspace? That was a previous video. Secondly, I can't get too low or close to the ground. 119 talks about uh, avoiding 
um, persons and property near the ground staying 500 feet or more away from persons or property or 500 feet away over a sparsely populated area? Your instructor will review this with you in 119. What if I'm flying over a populated area like a city? 119 is the regulation that talks about being 1,000 feet above the nearest obstacle within 2,000 feet. Now you can see our city diagram right here and you can see in both cases. In the lower building, that's the building on your left, I'm 1,000 feet above it. I have to be 1,000 feet above that building and uh, within 2,000 feet. Now, in the diagram, look at the slightly taller building to the right. Okay, I need to be 1,000 feet above the highest obstacle within 2,000 feet. So as I fly over that city towards that higher building on my right in the diagram, I've got to be 2,000 feet above it. Now, a couple of things to notice about this regulation. Number one, that 1,000 foot clearance alone is not sufficient. Notice when you review this with your instructor, that regulation states, I must be at an altitude in any case or any position where I could make a safe landing without undue hazard to people and property on the ground. Okay, well, how do I take off and land from an airport? Aren't they going to violate that regulation? Again, review that regulation with your instructor and notice the point where it says, except for takeoff and landing. All right, let's go to our next one. In the table of contents, part 91, we're looking at 151. These are minimum fuel requirements. Review this with your instructor and notice that if I'm flying under visual flight rules, I must have enough fuel for my entire flight and 30 minutes of reserve. Now, you might not be familiar with this very much right now, but I'll tell you, uh, as you gain more experience, 30 minutes of reserve time is not that much fuel. Your flight school may have a different requirement. At EPIC, our requirement is 60 minutes of reserve. So it is possible for an operator to impose a larger fuel reserve requirement than the regulation. Now, we cannot impose a smaller fuel requirement, but we can impose a larger fuel requirement. Also, 151, take a look at the fuel reserve for IFR. Notice for IFR, it now jumps to 45 minutes. Again, that's not all that much. And EPIC requires, again, 60 minutes. Okay, let's take a look at our last reg here. Now, also in the table of contents, we're looking at 159. Now, 91159 talks about VFR cruising altitudes. What this means is I am taking off on a cross country. I want to go visit some friends and family up in Georgia or the panhandle of Florida. And I'm going to be flying cross country using VFR or visual flight rules. 159 says when I do that, I have to select an appropriate VFR cruising altitude. And the way we remember this is if I'm westbound, it's an even altitude. And if I'm eastbound, it's an odd altitude. So westbound would be 4,000, 6,000, 8,000. Eastbound would be 3,000, 5,000, 7,000. Now, we're not quite done yet. If we're VFR, we must add 500 feet to that altitude. So if I'm VFR westbound and I select 
oh, 6,000 feet, then the regulation says I must be cruising at 6,000 and 500 feet. Now the reason for this is to keep east and west bound traffic at different altitudes to help with, what do you think? Collision avoidance, of course. So eastbound and westbound, can we be a little bit more specific about that? Yes, we can. First of all, it's magnetic heading, not true heading. And when we say eastbound, we mean from zero degrees magnetic to 179 degrees magnetic. And when we say westbound, we mean 180 degrees magnetic through 359 degrees magnetic. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about collision avoidance and four specific regulations, 91, 113, 119, 151, and 159. Who remembers the memory aid for wake turbulence avoidance? Has to do with a cup and the wind? If you said in the cup and upwind, you got it. Well, folks, that's a wrap for wake turbulence and collision avoidance. We'll see you next time.